Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Channel Futures webcast, The Digital Worker, How to Empower Customers with a Flexible, Scalable VDI Solution to Enable Remote Work, sponsored by Corel. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the help widget on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. If at any time you're having problems with the audio or advancing the slides, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. To submit your questions for the speakers, use the Q&A widget at the bottom, and you can also find educational assets available for download in the resource widget. Today's web seminar is being recorded and will be available on demand for 12 months starting tomorrow, and you will receive an email when it is ready. So let's meet our speakers today. We have Bill Clayman, Contributing Editor at Channel Futures, Dennis Kolar, Strategic Director of Strategic Alliances and Channel Partners Parallels, and Kyle Fenske, Strategic Channel Manager, Scale Computing. And with that, the floor is all yours, Bill. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, this is everyone. Everyone, just buckle up. This is going to be a really fun conversation because we were we were doing a great pre-call, and literally, Kyle's like, Bill. We need to stop talking about this because I'm getting way too excited about the topic of conversation because everything you're asking is going to be in the slides. So, so we stopped, we sat quietly, and we just got very excited and ready for this conversation because it, it's going to be a chat. Listen, before I give you sort of this lay of the land, I want to say that uh, Kyle and, and Dennis, we, we love an interactive audience. We really do. So if you have a question, comment, concern, anything at all, Put that into the Q&A or the chat window. Actually, it's going to be the Q&A window. Mm -hmm. I promise I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. So if you ask a really good question, I'm going to stop Kyle and Dennis. But listen, we've got a great audience question. We're going to answer it right away. Um, so you're looking at the agenda. Let me give you a little bit of a, of, a, of a lay of the land, what we're going to be talking about, and really why this is also special. Um, the way that our customers and users <clears throat> engage at work has, has, has changed drastically. Um, and this trend that we're seeing out in the industry is really showing no signs of, signs of slowing down. How we access things, devices, uh, content from work, from anywhere, um, it's imperative to continue to deliver these tools regardless of what we're doing. Here, here's the bottom line. There's no more barriers. There's no more perimeter, okay, in how we support today's digital workers in a connected digital economy. So while many... Enterprise solutions, and I, this is me putting on my virtualization architect hat, are still complex, challenging to manage, carry months-long implementation timelines. We're seeing that customers desire this more eloquent, this more uh, improved, easier to use infrastructure, really, that's more efficient to deploy, more efficient to manage, so that we're putting, uh, you know, planting seeds and not putting out fires for our business constantly, and being able to scale Everybody, this is a really important part, being able to scale with the pace of a new and connected digital economy. We're going to talk about that. We're going to discuss some simple, powerful solutions that are helping uh, you know, customers and partners win new kinds of opportunities. We'll talk about edge, new strategies for more application delivery, um, and really how partners can revitalize the revenue streams by providing customers and partners really a seamless VDI experience that is right. easy to deploy, improve security, and uh, ultimately improves TCO. So let's let's jump into this conversation. Like I said, we love interactive audience. If any questions or comments, go ahead and throw those in there, and, and we'll, we'll cover that. Um, if th this next statement is like the statement of the decade, everyone here should probably roll their eyes because this is like, hello, Captain Obvious. People are still connecting, but it's different. It really is different. Like we've got a bunch of people on this webinar. And I'm willing to bet that almost all of you are wearing pajama pants and you're comfortable. And that's a good thing. We, we like comfortable people during our webinar because, because you're still connecting, but it's fundamentally different. And yes, there's small deviations and variances as far as how we're connecting, but you cannot argue that over the past couple of years, two and a half really, the way we access critical resources, the way our customers or partners access critical resources has fundamentally shifted and changed. We now have employees, workers who never dreamed of having to work from home are now working from home full time using technology that sticks, finance, marketing people who thought that I have to come into a physical office and work here all the time. That is that is not true anymore. And this is where I want everybody listening to this to have a reflective, introspective moment. What are you doing to support 
that kind of connectivity for those kinds of partners and customers. What we've seen over the past couple of years is technology that sticks, right? 64% had technology firsts, we'll call them, um, in the last year. 81%, the majority, are going to continue to use these new skills and technologies post-COVID. Um, and look at these. Look at all these firsts. And by the way, everybody on this webinar, if you had a first that is in this spectrum, drop me a note. Maybe you had your first video conference, telehealth visit, order some groceries, um, read a QR code on a menu and, and scanned it. You know, I certainly had a bunch of firsts as well, attending a wedding and a funeral online. Very strange, not at the same time. There were two different events. <laughs> I should have probably clarified that. Um, and then these virtual experiences were certainly embraced, but obviously in real life is still really important. So how do we find this balance? Because we are ultimately supporting a new kind of worker, a digital worker, right? Do you remember this? where we could stand that close next to another pure human being. Nobody here has a mask, which is really weird. But, you know, we are truly supporting a worker that's gone from what you're seeing on this screen to this. This is you, right? Suit and tie, polo shirt, and completely comfortable pants underneath. And I think this is, this is great because for a lot of people, this is their desk. Um, but what we don't realize is just how much time we've been spending on these kinds of mobile devices. All of these all these little things that we've got in front of us, right, that we use every single day to get content because the share of time on mobile devices only continues to increase. They're not these big clunky desktop machines that I'm, we're working on. They're much more mobile laptops, mobile phones potentially. And that number only continues to increase. So my question to all of you is how are you working with partners? How are you working with, with, uh, with customers to deliver applications? desktops, critical resources to a very, very mobile distributed user base. Um, you know, and this is where I'm going to put my hat on for a little bit. Uh, I spent over a decade in the channel industry, right? And, and so we start to see these problems, especially over the past couple of years. And I wouldn't be surprised if I see some head nodding happening here uh, from some of these challenges that you might be experiencing out in the space as well. So I'm going to list the top five that I've seen out there. Maybe this, this, this uh, rings a bell. Silos of tools, technologies, and technologies and business processes. This happened when we tried to band-aid a whole lot of things when the pandemic started, right? We had more users being distributed. We had fewer people in the office. And all of a sudden, we were supporting our users and our customers and our partners. But we had silos of operations and technologies that weren't necessarily on, on, um, on one screen that we needed to look at. And this created some serious problems because management, right? Time spanning management programs and partner programs and NDFs, SPIFs, the actual architecture itself, you know, it became a serious issue for a lot of bar and channel and partner leaders out there. Challenges with traditional tools and security for digital workers, that became an issue because the more spread out you are, the more data and content you have to deliver. How do you geolocate it? How do you isolate it? Especially when you have different tool sets. Um, capacity, legacy tools present real business challenges with growth because you just can't keep up because you're constantly putting out fires. So you just don't know how to scale effectively. And then finally, integration. Your ability to integrate business and technology tools with new partner programs is actually more difficult than before because too many screens to look at, too much data to try and take in. So how do we sort of bridge all of this together and how do we actually create a platform and an architecture to support today's users? Okay, 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 deep breath, everybody. I'm gonna share a result from a recent uh, study that I had a chance to participate in it and, and I could write up a report. It's from Information Week. Um, you know, this is a, a mini little curated snapshot uh, because when we start to talk about digital modernization, everyone's like, oh my God, this guy is throwing out another marketing term. I'm not, I, I'm not. Please understand that this concept of modernization is, is not a cool, funky marketing word. It's about survival, okay? And there's, this is a quote from Lewis Carroll, actually. Here we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if we, sh and if we wish to go anywhere, um, you know, you must run twice as fast as that. And this is where we're going to explore some new research around modernization and what people are doing. Just take a look at these numbers. This is from Information Week. 84% stated that they're doing some kind of modernization initiative with another 9% stating that they're going to be doing something very, very soon. Only 7%. And we're going to need to talk to that 7% because they are going to be fading into obscurity if they don't modernize. You know, maybe you don't have any plans initially, but take a look at this, everybody. 
take a second, get off your Amazon shopping list. Take a look at this. Where do you fit in? Are you trying to improve processes, efficiency? Are you trying to get closer to users and customers, reducing complexity, better visibility of data? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of questions you need to ask, again, introspectively about what you're doing today around your transformation and modernization efforts. And if the tools that you're deploying directly support that. And again, changes that are that are impacting us and what leaders are saying in the partner communities, take a look at this. Too, it's just too complex. I, I can't keep up. Friends, I, I can't keep up with how I deploy my systems with what my users are demanding. Lack of understanding from business or IT units because there's too much disaggregated technology. Um, ensuring technology is aligned with the business, removing rigidity, uh, personnel expertise, budgeting. So all of these are key concerns throughout what challenges are facing today's leaders. And again, you might be in this bucket and that's okay. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit today. So I'm gonna take a deep breath here. We're about to introduce um, Kyle and, and Dennis. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me. It's good, it's good to have you. <laughs> We're gonna be bringing them in in, ju in just a second to talk about the tools and partnerships that empower the digital workforce. Pretty much everybody here, including my, myself and everybody listening as far as what they do. Um, so we're going to jump into this, and I actually I've got a couple of notes here because um, I, I thought of a couple of additional questions. And so we're going to get right into this uh, chat right here with with uh, Colin Dennis talking about you all, digital workers, how we partner differently and how we enable a much more flexible and scalable solution. So I'm just I'm just going to jump right into this, Dennis. If it's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you here a little bit. Uh, with it, with this first question, because I think I think this is this is where we get a lot of really fun things to talk about. Um, obviously, obviously, everything is different as we look at the traditional remote worker. You know, the pandemic was a perfect storm for organizations to innovate and adopt new solutions to truly support a distributed workforce. But some were able to modernize, but some were continuing to to have different kinds of challenges. So, my question to you here, and then and then Kyle, please jump in afterwards. How are new partnerships and channel solutions creating better architectures to support technologies, remote workers um, that, you know, obviously are clearly going to stay remote? Remote, Dennis, what do you think? Yeah, so I think um, it's actually a marriage of, of different technologies, if you will. So and the reason that we're here together today between Parallels and Scale is, is really about our technological and architectural partnership. So we both live in in the virtualization space, and um, you know, so we we come at it from a standpoint of you, know, you can work anywhere, anytime on on any device. So we're building an ecosystem um, between ourselves and uh, and our partners, as well as our customers, around how we deploy that and uh, and make it all work. Makes sense, yeah. Kyle. I, I've got a I've, I've got a fun slide here, and this is where I, where I'd want to get your your input here as well as, as partnerships, and maybe you can talk to some of these use cases as well. Sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Okay, I'm um, Dennis. I don't know. Did you want to talk to the use cases that you had up here? Yeah. Well, I just said this is some of the validation, right, that we've learned over the past um, actually five years, but more importantly, the last couple of years as we virtualized, but. Just talking that at what our, our partners are saying, and, and this is in, in the vein of our partnership with Scale as well, right? It's it's uh, we have an easy solution that that allows them to to deploy quickly at scale, globally. Um, it's a secure solution set, as you can see from from this whole perspective. We make it simple. We take take very complex virtualization concepts and uh, and also historical. Um, deployments, if you've had to deploy some very sophisticated or very challenging uh, configurations in virtualization, we've taken those concepts and made them very, very simple. And our customers and our partners validate that in, in terms of these references here. Perfect. And I think just to add on to pretty much everything that Dennis is saying, I think at the start of the pandemic, everyone that went remote, they went remote in the mad dash. So. <laughs> Even thinking about it now, a lot of people are kind of sitting back adjusting those panic decisions just to get to um, a structure that worked. And what Dennis was saying, one of the best things about like scale computing and parallels in this partnership together is the simplicity of everything. Our goal from the beginning was simply to provide a solution that customers of all sizes um, can easily stand up and manage. It's not just 
the size of the customer though, it's about like the different verticals as a whole. Uh, I know we've done deployments in healthcare, financial, state and local government, things like that. And one of the, one of my favorite things that I love to hear from people is that a lot of these customers that think that they can't go a VDI route because it's too complex or it's made for the enterprise space and so on and so forth, that's where this partnership can really come in and drive home that simplicity aspect of everything and put an enterprise level technology and solution in their current budgets. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and he, here's the funny thing, everybody listening, this slide that you're seeing, I actually, today was the first time that I saw it. And those challenges that I talked about, I put those in before this slide came live. Um, and it's, it's obviously talking about security, which we discussed, uh, supporting uh, a truly global scale capability. And then the other one was being able to access uh, apps and remote storage from any device, you know, any time, right? Truly supporting a distributed user. Um, can we stay on this slide for just a second? I do have a follow-up question here as far as what's happening in the channel and partner space. Um, but something caught my attention here, the data protection element of it, how it's at the core. Uh, Kyle, could you could you maybe start with that? And then, uh, Dennis, I'm just curious because, you know, yes, remote workers are changed. It's so different today. But why... Why is this part specific, the data protection element of it, so, so important to understand? Kyle, what do you think? Data protection, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, data protection is kind of what everyone is dealing with nowadays. Uh, you see it case after case, who's being hacked, um, who's the latest headline out there in the news. So everyone is constantly looking for different ways and different aspects to better protect themselves so they're the, not the next um, next big name or next big data leak that's out there. So right. being right. able to take advantage of technologies and partnerships like ours that work together to provide solutions like this, that you can just kind of feel a little bit more comfortable knowing that it's not just one vendor, but they're jointly working together to provide a solution that helps protect me at, at the core. Dennis, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say too that what we learned very early on um, became a very strategic advantage for us and our partners. That you know, when you virtualize things, you you mitigate a lot of security risk. What I mean by that is, if people were taking pre-pandemic, as the pandemic started to lock down, people were taking devices home with them, and those they realized that those devices were not secure. Right? So mm -hmm. now with this solution, which made it very easy and adaptable for, for companies to say, look, you don't care if they're using a, 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 an iPad or, or a web browser um, or, or a company deployed asset, PC or MacBook, it's secure because the data resides within a controlled centralized location. And it's not at risk of, of falling into the hands of somebody else because you left the computer on the network and it was, it was hacked. Um, you know, on your home network, right? Because we, we see that there's pervasive elements of uh, phishing that goes on in, in home networks as well, in remote networks. Think of Starbucks and all the other, other components out there. So quickly, they were able to deploy. They didn't need a VPN. They were secured their data. They checked all their boxes for, for compliance purposes, and uh, they didn't skip a beat from a productivity perspective of their employees working remotely. I'm just going to add one final thing. I know we're spending a little bit of time on on, on use cases and security. Um, I had a lot of experience deploying converged architecture and in, in, in different kinds of solutions. So whenever you have an environment that is integrated at the virtual layer, so the, the, the virtual desktops and applications you're delivering, and that's deeply coupled with the underlying physical layer, that's a goodness. That's, that's a huge win for simplicity in the way you're able to deploy it. One final note before we move on here and focus on the channel and partners a little bit more. I want to make sure everyone hears this. Everybody, because we have a lot of different kinds of people on this on this webinar, everything from universities to IT solutions to the enterprise, everybody's a target. Everybody's a target. And the reason why these statements from Dennis and Kyle are important is because take a look at who said that data protection is important. Water Environment Federation. Utilities are a target. People who use water, people who are cities and municipalities, um, anyone and everyone is a target. So anything you can do to improve data protection, you know, absolutely, you know, absolutely do it. Um, all right, let's let me let me shift a little bit here. We talked about some really great use cases where customers directly benefit, but I want to go back a little bit and talk about the channel 
um, and maybe some partner opportunities or just partners in general and what we've been seeing out there. Um, it's not only our customers that have been working towards greater levels of modernization. We saw a really high, excuse me, high number of people focusing on that, but partners and corresponding solutions have been innovating and modernizing as well. What I'm curious about is what makes this partnership between you two different and how are leaders evolving to support remote workers um, as well as channel partners that are striving to be leaders in a connected economy? So, you know, let me let me start with you, Kyle, because we had we had Dennis answer the first last time. Sure. So um, you kind of mentioned it previously, but customers are they're still dealing with the same struggles and challenges that they have been for many years. And a lot of this is like whether it's expertise in virtualization or the cybersecurity aspect of things, there's there's not a constant need for them to change and adjust and move things around on the fly. So uh, that's the first challenge that everyone is dealing with. Mm -hmm. Now, if you add the additional stress of people that have now gone remote and that, like you mentioned, the remote side of things is not going away, it's not going to change at all. That's oh. where these different technologies and being able to bring solutions like this together really push it to the top. Mm -hmm. um, you're not necessarily going to a customer and providing them just a standard renewal quote or that one-to-one -one replacement. You can go to your customer with a full solution on something that's been vetted out. Uh, and I know between the both of us, we like to pride ourselves on making that partner look good. So like we can go through and have those partners trained up, have them have the um, collateral or the talk tracks and everything like that available to them. So when they're going to pitch these to the customers, they actually feel confident in the solution that they're bringing to the table so that their customers can see the value of it right away. There, a lot of maturity statements there, and that's really important, right? This isn't something that I think you and Dennis thought of yesterday, like, oh, let's do a webinar about it. Now we're partners. There's, there's a lot of maturity <laughs> here and a lot of validation here as well. Um, Dennis, talk to me why, why you feel that this partnership is different, right? You come in from like a virtualization perspective. Um, so obviously the underlying hardware is, is really, really important, but how are you making life easier and um, what's the value of this partnership? Yeah, so, so I think um, the value of the partnership is this, right? When you look at how we design, develop and deploy our solutions, our philosophies are very similar, right? Let's take these complex, very, uh, um, what I would call almost legacy concepts, because virtualization has been around forever, right? I mean, <laughs> it, it goes back to Citrix in the, the 80s. Um, this, so the technology is not necessarily new, but what's always been the drag, I think, for, for partner in the community of adoption through, through the channel has been the level of complexity and the complexity means the partners have to make huge investments in their people, their systems and their processes to support a vendor. That means you have to choose a vendor and you know what, that might not necessarily always pan out. With us, we've taken a different approach. Let's take this really state and known uh, technology, simplify it, move it down to a UI level, to so user experience, whether you're deploying it and designing it or whether you're using it, and make it simple. Make it a wizard-like approach to, to installation and, and utilization. And that was the power that, that really came from, from our partnership to the channel was the channel brought forward all the opportunities in the pandemic, right? People needed to be able to work remotely quickly. We provided them with an end-to-end -end solution that was simple to position, easy to deploy and support, and then we backed it up with great support of the partner and the customer. So mm -hmm. at that point, it was, you know, we removed all the barriers, right? We checked all the boxes for compliancy. We made a price point that was adaptable, right, uh, uh, consumable for everybody. And we just helped partners go win the deal. I, I, that, there was so much information there. Um, you know, there, there's a, there's a funny saying, right? Congratulations. You've achieved your six year IT plan in six months. And I think that's what everybody felt over the course of the first year of the pandemic and what we saw out there. So anything, Dennis and Kyla, you can deliver that makes it easier. Um, I remember working, and I'm not gonna call out names, a specific virtualization technology, um, and how how excited I was and how how like happy I was that they finally made something wizard driven. And it was when I was deploying a load balancer 
and it was just so complicated to have to import different parts of a certificate and then re-import it and break the certificate apart. And then later on, they're like, just click next and upload the whole thing and that's it. And it just makes everything so much easier. And here you are talking about an enterprise ready solution to take on new people, new customers, new use cases. Uh, so I think I think this is a wonderful opportunity and actually also kind of a really good segue into our next question here. Um, a lot of partners are trying to understand the new emerging concepts of value. Now, I know we all know what that word means, um, but it, it's definitely changing out there. So for all of our listeners, everybody listening today, it's important to discuss the true value of any solution. So we're going to we're going to talk about that. Right. We're going to ask some some very candid questions here from 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 Kyle and Dennis. Um, you know, we have to have great technologies that are joining together to make life easier. We really do. We cannot, in today's connected world, introduce new levels of complexity and fragmentation. Just can't. So here's my question. And Dennis, let's start with you. How how are these solutions and how what are you doing specifically for both the end user as well as the partner to make life easier? And then the second part of that question is, how are we helping support a partner community that's looking to get into you know a new tier of customer support or at least get get into a a new kind of value conversation yeah so i'll, I'll take the the partner side first right so mm -hmm. we've again with this partnership and the programmatics we built around it it's to really enable the, the the partner to crawl walk and run with our solution so if you need us there to do the heavy lifting to help you even at the qualification stage and move this through your 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 sales cycle all the way through closure deployment and support we're there so again uh, we know that not every partner is 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 purposefully built to understand these concepts nor do they have the support on staff so we've evolved our our programmatics to support that Right, go because partners have wonderful conversations and, and relationships with their customers. What they need is a solution set that keeps their brand in the game. So we're right labeled as well. Uh, you can advertise parallels, you can advertise scale. We love that. But if you want your brand out there or your customer wants their own brand on the solution, we enable that. So we remove a lot of the barriers on the, the, the technical difficulties for selling it, mm -hmm. uh, deploying and managing and supporting it. While at the same time making it a solution that's that sticks with the with the partner. That that makes sense. You know, you want to have that level of stickiness and, and have that new kind of value conversation. Uh, Kyle, what are your thoughts there? Um, you know, scale computing has been around for for some time, and I, I'm very proud to say that I've seen you and your organization mature beautifully in this industry. Um, but you too have changed the value conversation. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So at scale, I mean, at scale computing, we've we've continuing to innovate in different ways, and we're looking at different ways that help both the end customer and the partner alike to just make the infrastructure simpler. Uh, one of the ways that we've adapted currently to drive essentially revenue is through our MSP program. Mm -hmm. The uh, the scale computing platform essentially enables partners to build a MRR business model around infrastructure. You can offer a new service revenue streams uh, without that painful upfront bill anymore. And then you can adopt um, adopt the management and cybersecurity backup DR and all that um, on the back end. With We just launched our scale computing fleet manager uh, tool. It's a cloud-based infrastructure management tool, essentially. So now um, we have partners that can go through and sell, manage, and then manage the infrastructure of all their different partners out there through one console. So you can see all everything you have deployed. If one goes down, you have a notification that comes to it. So it's truly kind of set us apart um, to be able to offer a different technology to consume and manage what they're selling out there. I, I, I love this. I, so you, you're literally talking about an easier way to consume and deliver and deploy a robust access technology that's obviously quickly working with, with, uh, uh, with parallels here to, to really change how you look at, at that value conversation. Um, and, and Kyle, I actually do have a follow-up question here for you. I'm taking a couple of notes here as we're having this discussion. Um, how, 
how do these types of solutions, uh, and, and Dennis, let me ask you this one, how do these types of solutions remove complexity from being able to just simply go to market faster? Um, and and I'm, I'm gonna pause here for just a second. In 2019 and 2018 and 2017, that question was different than it is today. Like how, how do you go to market today versus in the past? So what I wanna focus on is like the today scenario um, where where we're talking about these solutions that fundamentally help simplify it. So, so back to the question, how do these solutions specifically help remove uh, complexity from go-to market strategies, especially for like that, that mid-tier partner? Yeah, so to, it, it, again, it's a, I keep repeating myself, cause it, but it's a simple equation for us. Um, you know, we've ta- done all the heavy lifting. We've simplified uh, the process, right? And so what we also do, I think, very well together is to qualify the customer up front with the partner. Mm-hmm. So based on what their needs are, what their environment looks like today, what, uh, you know, what their pain points are, and then from there we – we evolve or mold our solution around what's already existing because we play well with the current you know infrastructure we augment or we can replace um, but that's all based on on customer and parking and customer need working with and through the partner so again the platform is platforms themselves that unique um, way that we we approach things to simplify that that's step one but step two is Qualify, qualify, qualify. Make sure that we're we're enabling the, the partner with the proper solution for the customer, and then from there, once you get that right, it makes you know deployment, turning up, training the people, going live a whole lot easier. That that makes sense, um, and you, you you need to be able to to you know scale right. Pun intended. Scale effectively as effectively as you can, especially when you're onboarding a lot of people. Kyle, I'm going to ask you a, a, th- that same follow-up question as far as go-to market strategy, but I'm going to focus on scale computing specifically. I, I have been lucky enough to have been involved with this platform in its infancy with one of its founders, and I'm seeing it today uh, really get to a big maturity point. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Kyle, I think you all are the first um, uh, you know, sort of converged architecture that's offering a cloud-based, cloud-based fleet management solution for like mm-hmm. Edge, for example, that can manage everything from like one to, if I'm not mistaken, like 50,000 clusters, which is extraordinary, right? And then you've got yeah. this architecture where you're, you're, you're coupled with Dennis's technology in parallel. So you've got this super scalable Edge technology that's literally designed for distributed computing. And then you've got um, Dennis's tech parallels that's on top of that as a remote access solution that gives you powerful access to uh, applications and desktops. So I'm going to ask you this, um, you know, We've seen this go-to market strategy conversation change from from a physical infrastructure perspective, keeping it easy and simple, removing that complexity. How does your solution do that? And again, really try and focus on on you know today's challenges. So it's interesting because you kind of hit the nail on the head um, with a lot of the um, the setup there. Scale's big focus is removing com- uh, complexity. That's kind of been built into our DNA from day Mm -hmm. one. And even going into whether it's a managed service provider providing support to hundreds or thousands of different customers to a distributed edge uh, technology where you have someone that has thousands of different locations out there and they're spinning up new ones left and right. The the idea is how do we essentially enable customers to provide an infrastructure in an easy to stand up way without a lot of overhead, without the need of additional manpower, because there's so many challenges that end customers and uh, service providers alike um, that are struggling with just to meet the demand, especially in today's Mm -hmm. world, that the more technology can evolve to support them to be able to get quicker, faster, more nimble, uh, that's where you're going to see our focus lies and where we continue to push the, the boundaries, essentially. And that's important for everybody to take, take back. Uh, this is one of those reflective moments where you're talking about a technology that's equipped and ready, an underlying physical infrastructure that's ready and equipped to support edge distributed computing at the highest level of performance and then parallels with, with Dennis's technology that's capable of delivering those really core pieces of content to those end users. Um, and this is a really good segue to, to this next pop piece of the conversation. 
um, the the intricacies, right? Some of the elements that go into once we combine parallels and scale computing together. Let, let's talk about some of those important aspects of why should we care about this, and especially partners and end users. Remote workers, you know, often, you know, pose a serious challenge to security and compliance, whether it's malicious or they don't even realize that they're sharing their corporate laptop with their kid who is now watching Paw Patrol. Um, and, and many times, many times, like I said, they don't even know they're 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 behaving risky, right? Where where their behavior creates inherent risk. So today's digital worker is already different than the users of I'm using this old school BDI solutions. So here's my question, and and Kyle, let, let's stay stay with you here for just a second. Why are today's users different, and do you feel they're operating in a riskier world? Um, it's so yes. Um, in the simple answer to that, I think cybersecurity as a whole, uh, needs to be taken very seriously because technology is changing. So when mm -hmm. you mentioned, are they living in a riskier world? Yes. The, it's going to continually get worse and worse just because that's how fast technology is changing from a day-to-day -day standpoint. Um, but even from customers and partners, they the ability to stay nimble enough to understand the different compliances out there, whether it's HIPAA or NIST, um, things like that, it, you have to be able to have the time to put into learning the technologies and knowing if the technologies you have in place are still up to the standard of what the threats are that are changing. Uh, one of the cool things about this partnership and stuff like that, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit, is like think of a CEO on the go. If he has a VDI deployment in place already, then he leaves his laptop in a hotel. Well, because of the way that the system was set up, that data isn't disrupted and it can't really be used again or used for evil, even though, because it's not sitting locally on that device. They have it all digitalized or virtualized into um, from a data center stored somewhere. So. At the end of the day, security is not going to go away. It's going to con continue to get worse, and it's going to start affecting not just the enterprises. Everyone from SMB to mid-market and so on are going to have to put different things in place to make sure that they're protecting their data. And, and Dennis, I'm going to bring you in here for just a second. Is this why we should care? You know, I think I think enterprises and uh, mid-market and SMBs maybe didn't care as much as enterprises. But they, they really should care because they're a target. Is this why we should be caring about things like compliance, accountability, security, automation? You know, Kyle, why shouldn't these be scary things? Well, well, compliance has is, is always been huge, uh, you know, regardless of, of the underpinning technologies and how secure they were. I think mm -hmm. it got accentuated uh, throughout, again, through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We have opened more doors for deeper conversations with, with customers based on compliancy. Um, for example, you know, uh, up until the pandemic, we very rarely had partners talking to human resources, as, but the human resources was a huge stakeholder because it would, they have to cover worker productivity, you know, the labor requirements and whatnot as you're pushing people from a controlled environment that was face-to-face -to, -face to a virtual environment. So mm -hmm. we, we started many a conversations and, and supporting partners with the talks, tr talk tracks to an HR executive and what that meant to compliance issues and accountability uh, for, for productivity, right, from the labor force um, and the people that they were going to then deploy on remotely. So it's huge. And then to follow that up, <clears throat> HR can carry on that conversation through to the security element of the question. Mm -hmm. right? The solution that we're deploying isn't on a laptop that they're procuring themselves. It's not our laptop that's going home with us. It doesn't matter what device it's on, the data is always secure. So it, it, it helps. It helps tremendously. And then, you know, just to cherry on top of that, when you talk about automation, well, you deploy our solutions together. They can scale up and they can scale down, you know, based on on demand. So if you don't have to touch it, right? You, you're all your security and all of your credentials and all the other components of the configuration for user access to the systems are there. When you need more, it spins up. When you need less, it spins down. So you're able to to monetize and more efficiently deploy your your solutions in a very secure fashion. 
quick follow-up question here for you, Kyle. On the topic of automation, scale computing, talk to me about how it supports automation, whether it's like patching, updating, some of those reactive things that we used to have to do are now much more proactive. So one of the things that, I don't want to get necessarily get too technical uh, here, but sure. one of the things that I definitely enjoy talking about and uh, one of my engineers' favorite things to bring up is that when you're going through the solution and you go to build it out, you can go through and build out a template um, of like, here's what the, the workstation needs to look like. Here's everything that needs to be on it. When you're coming to update things, you're updating one template. And then as Dennis was saying, as it scales up or people start logging in to need uh, new desktops and so forth, they'll just continually spin up more and more off of that template so that mm -hmm. that template is always providing the same updates and everything like that. And it even ties back into the security side of things of like when they start shutting down, it all just shuts down. It doesn't necessarily affect that template that you have built. So it makes it a lot easier to scale. I'm, I'm a big fan of templates and making it easier to scale and easier to update. And, and like, I get, like I said, going from like reactive to proactive and even prescriptive, I think, um, I think is amazing. Um, all right, all right, all right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this next question because I'm genuinely curious about about how how you're gonna answer this. So, um, you know, Dennis, let let's start with you here. Uh, I remember when I worked for a a bar, right? And there were times and instances when we just felt stuck. I don't know how else to say this, Dennis. We just felt stuck. Um, you know, and I've seen this over and over again, right? You, you know. Some of them are, are big, super large bars and bars, good for them, but many traditional partners aim at, you know, they're trying to take aim at this very lucrative market, the mid-market, but so many partners feel like they get this, they hit this glass ceiling and they're stuck and they don't know how to really find their value. Right. Um, and it's a bad feeling and you could actually sink a partner and, and make them, you know, not, not be successful in the industry. So how can these tools or these kinds of partnerships break that mold and how are these kinds of partnerships helping traditional partners and bars unlock their true potential? What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, so, well, just think about the traditional approach, you know, to, to vendor selection if you're a service provider or a partner, right? How, how, do, you, how do you place your bets, right? You place it on mm -hmm. an ecosystem, and that ecosystem oftentimes was built on complexity, right? So if you had that, that complexity, you had that mind share, you had the technical prowess, you know, you, you put your flag in and, and you supported it. But then all of this other elements came around. Well, how do we support software? How do we support compliance? And then you start adding more complexity. You might have an anchor vendor, but then you have to have sub -sub subsequent vendors that, that are built around that. And mm -hmm. do they have good partnerships already built? Or do they have APIs? Do you have to manage the API? So you insert in a, in more inherent uh, complexity into the solution set just based on the technology that you've built. So we've taken that out of the equation, put the best of breed of two technologies together, and then augmented it with a general partner program that leaves you no risk. So so when you choose to, to, to take a look at us, there's you know on the upfront what, what your costs are going to be, you mm -hmm. know what the value is to the customer and we hold your hand through the entire process. So you get, again, best of breed, we're integrated. That means that in an application level, single, as Kyle mentioned before, single pane of glass to manage the solution set between the two, it's very, very powerful. M makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, Kyle, anything, anything that you want to add here? Like we're, we're talking about, a, you know, and Dennis, I know you provided this for me. There's a lot of really key benefits here. Uh, bigger margins, right? You know, only going through partners, so really maintaining that channel and partner community, um, you know, providing, you know, the really true valuable solution. It's easier to deploy. Anything else you want to talk to this? This new equation, yeah. which yeah, I love. So, I mean I'll just say it this way. Uh, again, it's it's a new math equation. One plus one does equal three, and why is that? Um, you know, because the sum of our you know our, our two solutions is is, is the, the outcomes are much greater than the sum of the parts. And why? Mm -hmm. Well, because we only sell with and through our partners, so we're, we're very very focused in on the channel. 
Um, we provide a lot of margin rich opportunities, but also we are, we're there with you from the start to the finish and the after product, right? That, that comes along with it. Because the support side of this is really key. We, we really haven't touched too much on it, but that's where things get sticky, right? For, for the customer and for the partner. And if you do that well, because we respond in, in hours and, 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 and days to, to technical challenges and solutions. It's not, it's not weeks and months, right? Because so if you, you we're small, we're relatively small organizations, we're very scrappy, um, and we purposefully built our internal support mechanisms around a channel. Not, mm -hmm. not, so again, we're all about channel partners and supporting them, so we've optimized and built our, our organizations around the channel. So it's simple design, easy to deploy, integrates easily with existing infrastructure and in existing solution sets. And we wrap it around with, uh, with just a, a white glove of, of support for the partner and the customer. And, and Kyle, I want you to add to this if you can, but everyone listening to what Dennis has said, I was, I was in a mid-market, in a mid-tier like, partner. We, were, we weren't like a, a huge uh, you know, partner of our LAR, but we were sizable. Um, and one of the biggest virtualization partners in the country at the time, actually. And any time that you can provide, Dennis, that kind of support for a partner that's not huge is so, is so critical. Like, you have no idea how much of a weight you're helping lift. I mean, you probably do have an idea. It is, it's a huge, huge weight. Um, Kyle, anything you want to add, add to some of this? Yeah, and then I'm going to kind of add a little bit different of a twist to it, but I think one of the most interesting things that's going on in the market today is that many customers are seeing new faces and they're building new relationships from the ground up. People are changing jobs left and right and companies are being acquired left and right. So the recommendation out there is that customer that you may have had your eyes on and that you were trying to break into five years ago could very easily be talking to someone new today and being able to bring something new and exciting to the table that they haven't seen. Uh, for example, a few slides back, you had the Lewis Carroll uh, quote of here we mm -hmm. must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast. Mm -hmm. My advice to customers would simply be run in a different direction. Don't bring the same solution that the next guy did. Bring something different to the table that they aren't used to seeing. Um, and then just echoing everything that Dennis was saying is you don't need to have that titanium elite type partner level to get all the, um, the resources that we're going to bring to the table, whether it's help build that pipeline to get more leads and so on and so forth. We're going to be that added partner from day one of that conversation. I, I, I love that concept. Uh, you know, run as fast as you can. And if you want to, you know, just stay in place, you got to run twice as fast as that. But you can still run twice as fast as that, but you got to go in a different direction. I, I love it. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a modification to Lewis Carroll. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, and I appreciate all of this. And this is, this is really important. I think the simplicity, simple to, to design and easy to deploy. Um, and I, I do have a question about proof of concepts. Maybe, you know, I'm going to ask this one right now. I, I was going to save it for a little bit later. Does, does this specifically, the solution, I'm looking at that, those bullet points right there, easy to deploy. And um, Kyle, maybe you can help me answer this first and then Dennis. Um, like, does this make like things like POCs much easier, right? Like you can you just get a scale computing box, deploy it quickly, see how the parallels RAS looks, solution looks. Um, is, it, is it really that simple? It's from my side, it's definitely that simple. We have different promos that we want to put in place to make sure that we get the gear into your hands. And then our support team, we go through an onboarding process with all our customers to make sure that they have the hands-on approach to set the box up the right way and that they're wow. comfortable using the technology. Very cool. Dennis, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say too, programmatically, the way we built this, so we are integrated to in our demo environments. Uh, between the two of us, so when when a partner or a customer needs uh, needs that help and that that um, assistance, either setting up a POC on our own virtual, so we'll virtualize a POC for them on our segment of our our solution set, or if they're going to deploy it for themselves, um, we'll enable that either way, and it, it does. It makes it a lot easier because then you're getting the engagement with the customer. 
around the solution set and they're defining as you know, what their use case is. And then there's always those other questions, right? Can I do this? Can I add that? Can, can we do this? Oh, I can do this um, in two steps where before it took me six steps, right? So you get to, to work through all of that very quickly. And again, we, we make the user interfaces very simple for a reason. Uh, the, the complexity is there. You can go as deep as you need to with, with the technology, but we find with the POC, when we're there, we can navigate uh, very quickly to the meat of the matter. And what that means is customer makes a decision to move forward with us again in days and weeks, not, not mm -hmm. months and quarters. So we're, we're almost done. By the way, everybody listening, I, we've got some questions in the Q&A. If there's any more you want to add, by, by all means do that. Um, I've got I've got one last question that I do want to ask, um, and this is kind of like I, I really want to break down some of these fear barriers. But we'll call it fear, uncertainty, and doubt, like the butt of it, right? Um, and usually we see that kind of stuff when we start talking about like automation or like anything that people could perceive as replacing human beings. Even though, to be honest, we're, we're really not talking about any of this. Um, the, the the reality is here that for for some partners from many partners, especially in that, that mid tier, they're feeling like they're playing catch up with the market. So the question is this, uh, and, and Kyle, let's start with you here. How do these types of solutions create a much more proactive partner? Um, and then ultimately, how does this positively impact the user or the end user? Yeah, uh, pretty much being proactive is definitely hard, um, especially <laughs> in an in industry where you don't really know what to focus on that's going to provide those results. And one of the things that we've been doing at scale is we built out a channel structure where simply your success is our success. Uh, an example of this is we recently ran a campaign with a partner because they were looking to how do they uncover some new opportunities. So. Uh, they were able to pick a specific industry that they wanted to focus on, and we helped uh, work with them hand in hand to develop a talk track that was specific to that industry. Mm -hmm. And then we went through, developed a couple different email blasts, uh, a LinkedIn outreach email or message, uh, and then a phone call talk track. Uh, they were able to go through, put that into place, start um, reaching out to customers, and it actually ended up um, finding a couple different seven figure opportunities that we've already went through and closed accordingly. So looking at different ways and being able to use your partners um, to build that creative idea of how to be proactive, how to get in front of customers and bring it in a new way is something that we kind of pride ourselves on and are continuing to help uh, develop. Yep. And, and I think that I think that's really, really important. You, you really literally just mentioned something why why this shouldn't be a scary concept. Being proactive is hard and therefore sometimes can be scary and it doesn't need to be. Um, you know, we, we need to be exploring these kinds of new solutions because in our space, complacency, there's there's no room for that. Um, Dennis, w what can you add to this? Yeah, so, you know, back to the proactive components, you know, we enable that, um, but in, in simply by asking the questions, right? We do a lot of pre-qualification with, with our partners to understand what the use case is. And through that questioning, you know, we, we drive into, have you thought about this? Have you talked to this level of uh, person within the organization? You know, there are other vectors that we can have the conversation or bring other, other folks into to, to the conversation and discussion. So I think, again, our awareness of, of where we live and fit in the market space and using our expertise uh, in developing channel partners and, and routes to market um, we we take down the scariness, right? We we remove that that anticipation or that that trepidation about you know how do I take this to to my customer? Why? Again, because we we put ourselves in the partner's shoes and just start asking questions, right? And if you don't have the answers, that's okay. Here's how we go get the answers to assure your customer that we've got a winning solution. I love it. A little, a little bit of a uh, practice and empathy, right? Just you know, let me put on my customers and, and partner shoes and see how you feel. And I, and I think that's important. And that's how you develop these great kind of partner programs. All right. We have just a few more minutes here till we wrap up. Uh, if there's any other questions, let me know what they are. But I do have a couple of them here. Um, this one's like super straightforward. 
And I'm personally curious about this as well. So I can go back to my partners and my friends to teach them how to become better partners with you all. But how hard is it to become a partner with parallel and scale computing? What are the fees, obligations and requirements? I guess I can dive e into either, that one first. Either one can take it. Either, you're, you're both <laughs> probably going to have great answers. So like, Kyle, yeah, go ahead, you first. I'll jump in on that one. So essentially signing up with uh, Scale is easy. I mean, we, you can simply go to scalecomputing.com slash partners. Uh, there's a link to hit apply now. That essentially kicks off the relationship with um, our channel team yeah. here. And then we can work closely with you to walk through the different solutions, technologies, how you can earn MDF, how you can build out different campaigns. Uh, and our marketing team has gone through and built some terrific collateral that you can co-brand accordingly. But uh, there's no fees, there's no uh, obligations to become a partner with us. Uh, we are definitely just, we'll work with you to be a true partner as to how to go to market together. Perfect. And that again, I, you know, we are very much similarly built, right? There, there's no commitments on our side. Just go to parallels.com and you, you can select the partner program uh, for, for remote application server and, and you're in. Um, we always take a crawl, walk, and run approach to this. And we know that the adoption phase is the most difficult component when a partner comes on board of getting that first sale, right? And then beyond that, how do I template that success to get other customers? That's why we don't put a commitment on you. You don't have to prepay for licenses. You pay as you go. Your customers consume, we bill you for the consumption. They consume more, you pay more. If you consume less, you pay less. We make it real simple. So I've got a couple of other questions here that, that came in that I definitely want to ask you. Um, here's a quick fire one, Dennis and, and Kyle. Let's, Dennis, maybe you can start with here. Uh, do you have a validated? Is, is this is this architecture a validated virtualization solution? That was that was the question there. Uh, yes, it it is, and we, and we have reference architectures to to to, to prove that. Um, across the, a multitude of different um, uh, infrastructures, industries, and and compliance uh, concerns. Very cool. Kyle, anything to add? Nope, he's got it all there. <laughs> I, I love validated <laughs> architectures. I mean, I'm, I'm putting on my architect's hat, and hopefully that's one of the one of the things that there's, there's a lead behind. But like, I, I remember being an architect. That was like one of the first questions I asked when two technologies were joining together. Is there a val validated reference architecture that I can look at? Because that means I know it's supported. And if there's ever a problem, like you both talked about earlier, it's answered in just a couple of hours instead of taking taking way too long to get over that. Yeah, and, and, and if I may too, just to augment to that onto that, um, you know, our partnership with Scale. So, Scale is is lead. So everything that 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 happens happens with and through Scale. Uh, we are their wingman. Uh, we have spent an extensive amount of time uh, skilling and training their support organization. Um, and we built connections back to our top tier uh, support and design teams. So um, if a customer has uh, has a challenge with, with our solution set, uh, we are joined at the hip between scale and parallels at the, at the dev and support levels to, to ferret out any problems, bugs, um, or workarounds that are necessary to to solve problems. Hey, Dennis, let me stay with you here. We got like two more minutes, and I really want to ask this these couple other questions because I think they're important. <laughs> um, what does parallels and scale? Uh, actually, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm going to talk. I'm going to ask you this this other question here first, as far as cost is concerned. Um, Dennis, still with you. How much better uh, of a cost are we talking about when positioning scale computing and parallels against? other solutions, which in my personal experience, I know they can get pretty pricey. Yeah, so the short answer is there were 50 to 60% less. And and how, how can we make such a, a, a claim? Uh, well, yeah. when you look at the, the total the total cost of ownership, because when you look at a combined solution set, well, just look at a virtualization solution set in and of itself, right? The, the overall cost of, again, how much time do I have to get people up skilled so they can design and engineer a solution? How difficult is it to, to or easy is it to deploy the solution and get it up and running? Then how easy can I train a customer and, and their end users about how to use the solution set? 
And then how, what's a level of support do I have backing me up? So you take those four pillars um, and, and we take that very seriously. So we, we focus in on ease of use, but also ease of support, right, to, 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 to doing so. And that means your total cost of ownership is much lower. Very cool. Uh, Dennis, anything to add to that? I'm sorry, Kyle. Well, I would just say the, the other side of that coin is so, yeah. so your return on investment is quite high. So it gets back to the margins piece, right? Um, you've got somebody there that's uh, between scale and parallels who will help you go through the whole life cycle of, of finding the customer to, to closing the customer and then wrapping it all around support. Your margins uh, with this combined solution are absolutely astronomical. So. Um, try us. I mean, what, here's the other thing I would say to anybody who's out there interested and wanting to see this, give us an hour. That's it. Mm -hmm. Give us an hour between the two solution sets. You'll, we'll show you how simple it is. Give us an hour along with your use case and we'll prove ourselves. So what's an hour of your time worth, right? Yeah. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle, anything to add to that? No, I, he hit the nail on the head, but I, I completely agree with him. And uh, just give us a shot. Uh, give us a call and we'll walk through it and we'll we'll prove it for you. I, I could I couldn't you know and as we wrap up here I, I couldn't recommend that enough. Whenever when I was an architect and engineer, like one of the things that I love to do is proof of concepts and especially when there's a technology that's this easy to deploy and put into a rack and, and test it out and start seeing the benefits immediately. I think that's so cool to try it out. Um, that's it. That's it, Kyle and Dennis. This hour flew by. We are we are out of time. Thank you both so much for. For spending a little time with us today and talking about these really cool solutions i appreciate it very much um to wrap it up for us emily let me pass it back to you all right thank you bill dennis and kyle for the informative discussion and sue Carl for sponsoring today's event just a quick reminder the seminar will be available on demand starting tomorrow so please feel free to come back and review have a great day and thank you for attending thank you everybody Thank you.